We are delighted tonight to welcome Mary Kinua. Mary is a former chair of Fair Trade Africa. She is the director of human resources of Austrian development company, one of the world's largest ethical and fair trade flower farms. And she was for, fair, sorry, she was Fair Trade's head of delegation at COP26. I had the great pleasure of meeting some of that delegation during COP26. As supporters of the fair trade movement, we know that farmers are dealing with a climate crisis now. The livelihoods of those who work to produce our food, grow our flowers, our coffee, cocoa, the list goes on, are threatened now. Being in the global south and producing fair trade through their do the least to cause the climate damage. In fact, they're the leading the way with solutions. The climate crisis causes further injustice. This evening, we are asking Mary, can you, did COP26 deliver anything for fair trade farmers? Mary, I am delighted to hand over to you. Thank you very much, Charles. Um, and thank you everyone for joining. I, I almost cannot believe it has been a year, uh, almost a year since uh, we left the co-op. Uh, it's now the fifth month and uh, we were in co-op in October, November. Uh, and time really does fly. And I'm very happy to uh, spend some time just reflecting on the things um, uh, that we have achieved so far and how our co-op actually did go. My name is Mary Kinua. I am the immediate uh, chair of Fair Trade Africa, an organization that represents 1.1 million farmers in uh, Africa. Uh, I'm also the immediate uh, past chair of Fair Trade International where I sat as a producer representative for about 1.6 million farmers, both in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. I sat at the Fair Trade Board for about six years uh, at different levels. And it was such a pleasure being part of something really bigger than myself, lending my voice to this very noble cause and just uh, bringing advocacy at the center of the owners of the crisis, who are the farmers. I spent my time really just uh, having conversations with stakeholders, both the markets and the uh, producers themselves. At the producer level, we sat with a lot of clarity in appreciation that the world is changing. The world expects us to produce better. The world ex expects us to do right by our world, you know, take care of the world. But at the market, I found the disconnect was that no one was willing or ready to pay for this price. However, it was very encouraging to see a lot of you and the Scottish Fair Trade, for example, nation is one such example of how good uh, can be advocated by common men uh, and common women to actually make a difference. And that really has been my journey at the Fair Trade uh, Body. As an organization, I've worked for Osarian for six years. Uh, and Osarian has been committed as one of the organizations that initially um, uh, was certified as a Fair Trade farmer, committed consistently to ethics. But we've seen, of course, the uh, infiltration of uh, negative trade in the fly industry bring Osirian and other organizations of such uh, kind to their needs. However, it remains in my heart to continue to champion the to con continue to champion the fair trade agenda, to continue to champion the fair trade dream as is, and to continue to really ask like-minded people to partner with us. Now, my role as the head of a fair trade delegation at COP26 started a year before Glasgow. And it was really, really for us to get across our voice, especially as farmers and workers. 
uh, and our demands for climate justice. I also sat in the Alok Sharma Advisory Council before COP, around a year before COP. And I spoke at the Climate Ambition Summit with about 140 heads of state. And the argument really was to focus on putting the producer voice at the center. The Alok Sharma Council for me was a proper commitment of the UK government to put the voice of the affected, the people at the front line of the crisis at the front to listen. And I saw a lot of uh, energy from, um, to, from Mr. Sharma to put us in the middle, to listen to what we were thinking and to also just include this in his requests when he actually submitted at the Co-op 26. It was a pleasure sitting on this chair, on this uh, uh, council. And I'm of course hoping that Alok uh, and, the, and the advisory council actually continue with this model of engagement for civil society so that the voice of the people affected actually can be heard. Speaking at the Climate Ambition Summit was a monumentous event, not only for myself as an individual, but also in gathering the voices of producers and bringing this to the world stage. The meeting with the Pope uh, in November also was one of such moments where the producer was placed uh, at the front of the world uh, stage to speak around our trials, our tribulation, but also our hopes and expectation for the, for the people who, are, who actually are affected. And of course, for me, just uh, talking at the, in the green zone, hosting conferences and hosting panels in the green zone, uh, having business conferences with the senators uh, of uh, the senators of America, meeting most of you. I met uh, Martin uh, and perhaps Charles also at the at the co-op. So for me, this was the highlight of actually putting faces to the people who are so passionate uh, about this war. And today I'd like to really discuss around really how the climate crisis is in fact impacting fair trade farmers. This is not only the flower farmers, but any farmer in the South uh, or any farmer, of course, who is affected by the climate crisis. And how, of course, our fair trade support, farm, fair trade support farmers, how we can support them to deal with this crisis. So what is the need today? I cannot overemphasize the many examples of how the climate, climate crisis is already hurting the farmers. In the late 2020, we had two major hurricanes which devastated Central America and fair trade farmers saw their crops of coffee, cocoa, honey and vegetables in both Honduras, Guatemala and Nicaragua completely devastated. This is what was in the news. This is what we all would know about. But in the villages of Kenya, in the villages of Ghana, in the villages uh, of India, more farmers were affected by different environmental challenges that have been a consequence of the climate change. Now, without any action, an urgent action on climate change, it will get worse. And by 2050, many cocoa growing regions in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, who produce at least half of the world's cocoa, will become too hot to grow the crop. Remember that the growing of crops for fair trade farmers or workers is really a human issue, it's a human rights issue. It is from these plants that we eat. It is from these plants that we feed our children. It is from these plants that we take our children to schools. Therefore, it's so this, our very life really depends on this. My country specifically in the 80s and 90s, we spoke about agriculture being the very backbone of our, 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 our country. Now, this is a far-fetched dream. Our water pans are empty. We still have people dying of hunger. And really, our own livelihoods as individuals are heavily reliant on our action to climate. What can fair trade do? And how can we call upon fair trade? When businesses and consumers choose fair trade, farmers and workers on the front line of this climate crisis really do have a fighting chance to care for themselves, to care for the families, and to care for the shared planet. Think about all the things that the farmers need to do to care for this planet. 
use organic fertilizers, for example, uh, engage in practices that do not uh, diminish the earth, um, trade fairly. If businesses and consumer remember to choose this mark, it means they remember to pay right prices. They remember to facilitate right the farmers and the farm and their families, and they remember to actually put their money where their real mouth is. Through fair trade, farmers and producers have the security of the minimum price, a, a very important uh, concept. And this provides a safety net specifically when market prices fail. And we've seen this consistently in our markets. We, the farmers are also protected by the fair trade premium, which really is an additional sum of money that farmers and workers can invest in projects of their choice. Some of these projects really include uh, planting trees, um, putting schools, which are of course reasonably priced for their children, ensuring they have clean water sources, um, creating infrastructure that enables them to transport their produce and, uh, and among other things. Environmental protection is one of the major uh, uh, principles of the fair trade standards. For you to sell a fair trade product, a farmer has to improve soil, water quality, manage pests, avoid using harmful chemicals, manage waste, reduce greenhouse emissions, protect bio bio biodiversity. This is what the standard requires of, of the fair trade farmers, for you to produce a proper fair trade farmers. Therefore, even without having uh, a call on climate specifically, fair trade really, the policies of fair trade sit at the center of um, ensuring that we actually are taking care of the environment. At the same time, fair trade makes training available to producers. You know, they make policies, world acceptable policies um, available to producers so that they can use late, the latest agricultural methods such as intercropping and shade grown coffee for them to adapt to changing conditions. Remember that growing is not only, producing is not only about tilling the land is about empowering the people to make conscious decisions. It's about bringing democracy to the people, making sure they make the right uh, decisions. And that's why the management of fair trade premium is ingrained as one of the principles of the fair trade organization. In the specific case of flowers, flower farms have had, of course, to adopt to a changing climate. We saw about two years ago, a heavy um, uh, infestation of pests which of course reduced the yield of flowers in Kenya. However, we've, there's also been a lot of uh, increasing pressure from the West in the, in the need to shift low, to low carbon production and transportation. And of course, to, to reduce the rich world consumption, uh, rich world consumption growing, growing in the coming years. Now, flowers grown in East Africa have been found to have a better carbon footprint than those grown in greenhouses in Europe. But that will not always be the case. So how does a flower farmer tackle the issue of transportation, reducing that greenhouse, and you're still paying a pence for their rows? So who then needs to come and partner with the, with the flower farmer? Who needs to ensure that the farmer can transport reasonably to the, to the, to the, to the Europe's at a cost, not only at a lower cost, but at the most climate friendly uh, way. Where is innovation? Where is cost for research and development? Who is funding this? So that they enable the farmer to actually do the right things. At the, COP20, 20, at the COP26, these are the things I was asking for on behalf of the farmer. I led a delegation of about 20 people, both from the North and from the South. And our main agenda really, was one to bring the expert voice. We really are the experts. We see a lot of white papers written around climate change. I'm not sure. We really are the one papers, but we actually experience the conditions that are described in those white papers. And we felt it was critical that we bring our voice to that conversation. We bring our context because our context cannot be erased. And what were we asking at the call? 
One, we were asking that the co-op, the farmers and workers who actually produce the food that we you rely on, both to ensure that they, we can cope uh, with the changing climate and to ensure that we are also shifting to the uh, carbon production in a fair way is actually prioritized. We were asking that the wealthy countries deliver on their 100 billion climate aid promise and that ensure that a proportion of these finances directly reach the farmers and workers to help them pay for the cost of adopting to climate change and becoming more sustainable. And especially in seeking this, we were worried that sometimes a lot of climate funds are provided, but they don't reach us. We who actually uh, need this money to make a difference. So we really were asking that the climate, uh, that the government find ways, find um, a way to ensure that that financing gets to the end user, to the person who's actually making it possible. Also just asking the government to support us and uh, enable sustainable partnership in, in this uh, journey. You know, ensure that the farmer is at the center of the decision making. When I, when I came to, to, to the co all good things about what they intended to do, both mediation, or we are at thought process stage. And I asked, when are you going to actually actualize these beautiful dreams and beautiful things? And most of them cited a lot of barriers to implementation whether it's funding, whether it's regulation. And governments really would support us to actually enable that we have those sustainable partnerships implemented. But also for businesses to pay the fair value, to pay the fair price, to adhere to fair trading practices, to ensure that they're constantly calling out those businesses and those people that are not trading fair. We are in a capitalist world and it is hurting the farmer. We are in a discount world and it is hurting the farmer. So really to request the businesses to stand up and we saw businesses like the co-op, uh, we saw uh, businesses like, um, you know, several, several other businesses actually come up to really, like I said, put their money where their mouth was. When you look at the uh, new trade rules, we were really requesting that the global policy to support highest environmental standards across not only for fair trade farmers, but for everyone, that this global trade policies require low carbon innovation, encourage sustainable products, uh, encourage the uptake of green technology along the supply chain. And of course, also the global trade policies set specific uh, minimum prices so that then someone is actually paying for this, this ask. Also, just to uh, support initiatives to strengthen environmental regulation, like what was being pursued through the European Union or the UK Environmental Bill in the value chain. Our other ask was around um, our other ask was around just ensuring that we see loss and damage included in the COP agenda. And it was quite disappointing to see that this was not included in the outcome document. And we are really starting to see permanent loss of livelihood as the weather changes. So it matters that it becomes part of the UNFCC commitment. For us, this is critical. And like I've said, it really does sit at the center of our very livelihoods. And these really were some of the things uh, that we really were asking the co-op uh, to, to Talk about. I listened to Alok Sharma speak the day before yesterday, and I see that he still remains uh, I, 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 concurs with us that this needs uh, saying this. Okay, so uh, like I said, really, those are some of the things that we really were asking for, you know, uh, the needs for workers to really sit at the center and ensure that they have they are prioritized uh, in this journey. Uh, to ensure that the wealthy uh, com uh, wealthy businesses uh, deliver on their 100 billion climate aid uh, promise, and also just to ensure that the people who the government the government policies that are put in place actually help uh, with regulating uh, the world in terms of fair production. So, what was delivered at the COP26, and what are really my reflections on this? So, first of all. 
I am pleased, and I'm sure all producers are pleased that there is now a clear timetable on the adaptation of finance. Of course, I'm a bit disappointed that we did not get quite get to the promise this year, but there is a timetable. And of course, we continue to push uh, that this is actually implemented. The new found funds announced for deforestation and a just rural transition are really welcome. But we must ensure that this finance actually reaches the farmer and their community in the poorest parts of the world. We need to constantly ask, is the penny getting to the last mile? Because that's the only way we will make a difference. Also, I would like to see the loss and damage included in the COP agenda going forward. Like I said, it was disappointing that this was not uh, included in the document. Uh, we are already starting to see uh, the permanent loss of livelihood as the weather changes. And it really does matter that it becomes part of the UNFCC commitments. What then needs to happen uh, for fair trade farmers in the future? What can you do? In this uh, fair trade movement, we're looking at what we can do now in the run up to COP27, in the Sham El Sheikh in Egypt, to help for, to press for new rounds of emission cuts and also the financial commitment. What you can do is lend your voice. My colleagues already at the fair trade are working towards this, are working towards participating in the council, are working towards ensuring that we keep the conversation moving. So what can you do? You can help us with lending your voice. Also, we also need to see further action on climate finance and specifically delivery on the pledges already made. How can we ensure that finance actually reaches farmers and their community, which is really a, a, a focus of fair trade? We hear that new funds may not start uh, being available until the end of 2023, but it's not clear how the farmers will actually be consulted and how these funds will be uh, processed. For you is to constantly keep in check those who are actually dispensing these funds and of course those who are distributing these funds. In the fair trade business pledge, we saw 27 businesses take action on climate change and, and, and climate partnership. And we know in fair trade that many businesses are keen to see action supported by government policies. We want to work with businesses to encourage governments to move to higher ambition. What you can do is talk to your local businesses to continue putting the business pledge, uh, in being part of the business pledge so that we can push our governments to be part of this conversation. I saw a recent poll for fair trade showing that 84% of Brit the British people say that more should be done to prevent human harmful trade practices. Seven out of 10 believe that the responsibility to do, to do this lies with the government. Two thirds of the public state that it's the job of the government to tackle, tackle climate change. And three in every five say, UK government should treat the climate crisis just like they did the COVID-19 pandemic. This was powerful for me to read from here. And this is what we, we need to hear more from the people who are supporting us, for the people who can speak for us. Pay right, pay fair, but also speak to the powers that are, uh, that are or that be, so that then they can actually come and make a difference. The, with this survey, there's a revelation that the public appetite for government action, the civil society movement cannot do it by themselves. The farmers cannot do it by themselves. The business community cannot be doing it by themselves. But then the appetite for government action on trade and climate is very high. So I am urging you as supporters to call on UK politicians to deliver on these promises made at COP, to provide new funding for farmers and workers in low income countries, and to face the worst uh, that are facing the worst uh, climate crisis. This is really my pledge to you. We also see a lot of uh, sharing of ideas uh, and it will be really important to actually see uh, you sharing your ideas with us in the South to see how we can channel those ideas to actually a sustainable movement. What is critical for us to note in the change in a better climate environment is that no single party shall do it alone. And the most disadvantaged people who sit in the South have something to bring to the table, which is context. And all we really require 
from everyone is support, is a coming together, is an ensuring that we push the right people and we just ensure that the commitments that are made are actually realized. I am glad that I participated in the co-op. I am glad I had an opportunity to present the voice of a producer at the co-op. I am glad for Fair Trade UK, for example, for facilitating and doing a lot of advocacy work to bring us to this table. And for Fair Trade International, of course, for partnering uh, with this cause. And I'm hoping that our voice will not go to waste, that a difference will be realized, and that we shall be able to make this world a better place. So really, these are my reflections for co-op. And I really want to appreciate you uh, as the Scottish Fair Trade Forum for the support you continue granting us, and I encourage you to stay the course. So thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you very much to you, Mary, for such um, an excellent Fair Trade Nation lecture, which has motivated us, as you say, to continue to champion fair trade and to stand with those most impacted by the climate crisis. I'm going to hand over now to Kira, who's been moderating our questions and will pose a few of those in the time that we have to you, Mary. Hello, and thank you, Mary, for that lecture. It was really, really fascinating. Um, just to remind people, you can still post your questions in the Q&A function. You can find it at the bottom of your Zoom. So we might have some time for those, but to get us started off, Mary, I was wondering, how do you think we can help to platform the voices and experiences of farmers on the front line? Uh, Kira, like I said, really, if you look at the survey that was re recently done, that voice, constantly lending that voice, uh, lobbying your, your, your senators, lobbying your members of parliament, especially, to keep them accountable to the commitments they have already made. The UK government, for example, was the, at the front line of a deforestation funding. But we, we want to see that actualized. We saw the co-op co uh, presidency carried by the uh, UK government, ensuring that the commitments and the promises made during this period actually are kept. What we'd like is forums such as yours, especially who have come together, who are already well organized to amplify your voice, whether it is through a direct engagement with your parliaments or simply uh, consistently reminding these people that they have a promise that they need to keep. But secondly, is to lobby your businesses. The business that is, the businesses to expand their fair trade shelf, okay? So that they are selling more fair trade product just as a commitment. And I, and I know some of your businesses have actually made these levels of commitment. Uh, but secondly, also to pledge to, do, to, 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 to trade ethically, to do the right things, to ensure that they do not shortchange, they do not, uh, for example, play the price card because the price card is one of the biggest problem we have. You have businesses that are ready to, for example, pay on, buy only 20% fair trade and 80% conventional. Of course, 80% conventionally traded goods, you know, it's up to whoever it is who's trading them to actually uh, trade unethically or otherwise, of course, in terms even of pricing. So US consumers really is to speak with your money, you know, and say, look, we will only support those businesses that actually are paying a fair price. When I come to the to the Europe, I buy a banana painfully in your supermarkets because I cannot believe how it left my hometown and got to yours and I still buy it at less the money I buy in my country. So for me, it's really to speak with your money, but also to lobby these businesses to do right. And also, again, to amplify your voices to the government. As you've seen, the government is a critical factor. We cannot do this also only as civil societies. We have to push this to the next level. And I suppose on that, in your opinion, do you think it's more important that businesses or governments take action? So it always helps if government takes action because uh, businesses are more likely to uh, fear, comply, okay? Uh, but pressure has to come both ways. We have to push businesses and this government has to push business. So my thinking is if we focus only on, let's say, the civil movement or only the producer or only the business or only, we have to put pressure across. We know very well that government is an enabler. For example, many governments putting together global trade policies is an enabler to the world environment. Uh, however, business 
businesses just affecting their own business. So we, let's say all traders of chocolate or all traders of flowers, or then also that is a business community we can impact. So for me, it's either, but we all know that every time there's a government directive, a government regulation, there's more compliance, you know, there's, there's more push for compliance. And we've seen governments put this when they're looking for taxes, when they're looking for other things. So it would be good for them to actually uh, look to implement this in, uh, in climate compositions. Uh, and this now the civil movement alone. It has to be government driven, business driven, individual driven. Thank you, Mary. And we've had a question specifically on fair trade flowers. Um, so this person has noticed that um, we've got European owned discount shops who are increasingly selling fair trade flowers. And we're wondering, do they import Europe wide or is it a kind of UK um, focused import? Um, I'm not very sure. About, uh, about that. What I'd like to really say is when you look at the cost of producing a flower, and we know we now have a research really telling us um, about what is the true cost of producing a flower. I think for us is to ask ourselves, does the discounting model work for the producer? You know, and when we engage a trader, when we engage at buying, whether we are discounting a bottle of wine from South Africa or whether we're discounting a chocolate bar from Ghana, we need to ask ourselves consistently whether that discounting model is paying for the ethical production of that product. When we, when we get there, then we will appreciate whether the discounting model works for us or not. When we look at uh, transportation, okay, uh, and, and even for example, the Europe growing of flowers in Europe against growing of flowers in the South, we also again have to ask ourselves, what is the value? You know, I know that they're in, a, I think in 2020, there was a push in, in the UK to now then uh, grow, not to, not to import from, from, from out of uh, Europe or, or out of, uh, out of, out of the, the UK. But we have to ask ourselves, we have communities that are based purely on our trade to you. You know, organizations have thousands of people who are dependent on that flower being sold in the UK. So when you, for example, shut down and say, no, we cannot buy from you because of carbon emissions, then we don't solve the world problem. We leave one part of the world a, a, worse, a much worse off part of the world because jobs are lost, livelihoods are lost, but we don't solve the, the, the human right problem. So the human rights problem is to be solved by finding a solution, for example, for, for a carbon effective transportation of flowers, for example. Therefore, we keep the South alive and we keep the producers of the South alive and the workers. And then we also satisfy the need for a, a beautiful flower in the, in the West. So when we think consistently about, about uh, pro sustainable production, we have to say, what is the challenge? How can we come together to solve our problem? Because the challenge we currently have is that the producer is expected to solve all the world problems by themselves without any support by people who will not pay for that price. So really is to ask ourselves, what's the problem? We have a carbon emission problem. What is the solution? How can we R&D? How can we research and develop a solution for it? And who will pay for it? Because if we then leave all that to the, to the farmer, it's going to become impossible. So when we look at discounting, and I'm specifically concerned around discounting, we really have to ask ourselves the basic question around, where is that product coming from? Are we paying for the true price of its production? And who really is paying the price of that production? If it's the farmer, then we are wrong. We are, there's something we are not doing right. Absolutely, thank you. Um, another question we have here is around what role does fair trade have in affecting or influencing progressive legislation that either influences or affects compensation with respect to minimum wage versus living wage? Now, at the center of fair trade is the minimum wage conversation. And, but we also appreciate that the minimum wage conversation cannot work without the minimum price conversation. Okay, so we, and, and, and I think this has been a constant push because we want fair practice, fair practice on the, for the, especially the workers. 
uh, this fair practice has a price, but then we do not want to discuss minimum price. So as, as for example, in the fly industry, I know that fair trade has actually set a minimum wage based on a study that was conducted in the fly, in the fly industry around the, minim, the, the cost of living in particular areas. And this has already been set and is progressively being implemented from 2018. Something I, in, however, let us be conscious to ask for one without the other. So the, the, the advocacy arm of Fetrid has gone out of their way to ensure that, especially in the fly industry, and I commend this effort and this is something we need to look at. And as producers, we appreciate that this is what the world is focusing on. The world wants that people get a fair wage and we want to comply, 100% compliance. But also we really are going back to the minimum wage conversation must be tied as the in conversation on organic uh, use of organic fertilizer, as on the use of green method uh, technologies, as the minimum, the, the sustainable production must be tied to sustainable pricing. But the fair trade movement is at the center. Remember, apart from social, apart from ethical, social is one of the biggest components of fair trade. The social element, ensuring that people are managed well, ensuring that people are, are handled fairly, ensuring they have a voice to speak, ensuring they are paid correctly. This is a bigger chunk. It's actually equal to the environmental chunk. So fair trade, if you look at the st fair trade standards, they really have an enabling environment for a social justice around the workers, around ensuring the workers are managed correctly. And I think that's something we can all speak loudly about. I think we are also as fair trade, we are not speaking very loudly about our gains. You know, we are having people come and speak about what they've done, but the fair trade communities, we need to tell our stories better. We need to tell our, our times better, our, the things that we're doing in the, in the villages, in the different places better so that then we can amplify our voice. But the social element of, 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 of production is very well enumerated in the fair trade standards. Thank you, Mary. And on the subject of the kind of environmental side of things, and um, we have a question here that asks, what mechanism does fair trade have to ensure sustainability practices and kind of concepts of sustainability are applied throughout the supply chain? So the, the fair trade uh, movement is a tripartite movement. So you have the producer on one side and you have the trader on the other side. In the middle, you have this standard body. And the standard body really just ensures that all parties are playing fair, okay? Now, in terms of ensuring that the supply chain is managed, there will be trade standards and there will be the producer standards. And there'll be audits continuously done on this both uh, on both parties anyone who subscribes to this standard will be audited uh, at this time and the standard will speak for example around if it's an environmental conversation so for example the use of organic or the use of specific or the banning or the stoppage of specific uh, fertilizers that will be audited at the producer level and at the trader level, assessments will be done on whether they actually are uh, looking, for example, to uh, the, the qualities they're taking, they're looking at the quality, uh, they're ensuring that they're using the right, for example, packaging, which is um, biodegradable. Uh, they are ensuring that they're selling correctly at the minimum price. So I feel that these, the fair trade movement itself has tried to cover the supply chain end to end. Of course, they only, look at 20% of trade or 30% of trade, whatever the trade is fair trade. There's a lot of conventional trade that is not covered under the supply chain. And that's where we say government regulation because uh, a, a voluntary certification, we cannot tell everyone you must be certified fair trade. Uh, however, we can say to the government, use this as your minimum. You know, in, in, in Kenya, for example, we say, use at least the minimum wage for fair trade as a precedent to show that this is the minimum wage you should pay an employee, whether this employer or is a fair trade farmer or not. So if we had government imposing those as main minimums, then we will be at a better place as a world. And I think that is why we say the government policy would do us better. It will advance us a little bit better. And as fair trade, really, they can only do so much on this 20% trade, but they really are ensuring that both the farmer and the trader are checked 
so that we have a sustainable production and a sustainable supply chain. Thank you. <clears throat> um, we have a question here that asks, how can we find out if the promised monies have been delivered and are there reports? I presume it's referring to um, kind of funds promised during COP26. Um, yeah, um, I'm, first of all, we're waiting to understand the how. How will the distribution happen? Who, through whom will that happen? Right now, all we're hearing is this is the promise. Uh, we are committed to the promise. But when they tell us the how, how they execute this, then we can keep these people accountable. If they tell us, for example, they are uh, sending this through uh, organization X, we can then put pressure on organization X to be more transparent about how they're using that money to, of course, but right now we really don't really know who to account, who to keep to account. And that's why we must keep the pressure. And the pressure really should be focused on ensuring that we the, the funds are directed in a channel that will reach the last mile. And then also for us to know who, who is in charge and who then do we actually keep accountable for these monies. So for us really is to really wait in anxiety to see the execution and to understand the parties playing the execution part and then to put pressure on these parties. Absolutely, thank you. Um, we also have, an, we have a couple more questions, but I suppose if anyone else has any burning questions to just add them in to the Q&A and we can see um, what we have time for. Um, so someone here has asked, what are the top three um, easiest products a UK consumer can buy to support fair trade? So uh, one, of course, is uh, flowers. The second is every chocolate, every chocolate bar you take uh, should, must be fair trade. And of course, our lovely bananas. Um, we have other products. We have uh, the wines from South Africa, lovely wines. Uh, we have um, uh, cot our cotton we have our spices from Asia, but uh, these three top products would be, is, is something you use every day. You, know, you take a glass of wine, hopefully, uh, or you, you give a friend a glass of wine. Uh, you also uh, eat a banana every day. I, I was surprised at how many bananas uh, you guys eat. Here in Kenya, we really don't eat so much. Uh, but if you are consistently looking at your basket, and buying fair trade products end to end, then would be in a much, much better place as a world. Absolutely, thank you. And just a couple more, I think, here. Um, so we've got a question here. Is fair trade involved in carbon trading? Um, no, but I know that we were challenged in the co-op around our involvement in the carbon trading and whether we could actually put a standard for carbon trading. Um, I think this is a new area of exploration. I know that we now have a head of climate, a very, very knowledgeable gentleman who's now working to, with the business to actually understand how we can uh, get into standardizing that trade. But as, a, as, a, as it is right now, we really, fair trade does not. Um, and I'd, I'd be uh, wrong, perhaps I haven't been on the board for a few months, uh, but as, as at COP, we still didn't have this mechanism or standard for tr trading uh, the carbons. But this is something that of course was raised and challenged to us uh, when we we're during COP. And I'm, I'm certain that the board will take uh, consideration around this. Thank you, Mary. And I suppose finally, just you have kind of touched on uh, this question already, but perhaps the final question we can ask is, what can we in Scotland do to best support fair trade farmers on climate? First of all, I really want to thank all of you. I was very uh, touched by the commitment you have uh, for fair trade and the fair trade movement. And you can only do more by just amplifying your voice because you're a, you know, lectures such as this bring awareness. Uh, just engaging your leaders. I know that you have a very, uh, very uh, good way of en engaging your leaders. Um, ensuring that consistently you're putting the pressure to the right people, writing to them, uh, asking them when they're delivering uh, on the promises they have made. This is what you would do, but most probably challenge the businesses 
um, most, most importantly, challenge the businesses to continue shelving more and more fair trade products. When I go into a shop and find uh, a shop that has full fair trade products, I'd be very, very pleased. So it will be good to see that this is something that is acceptable, but also individually and for your families and friends to consistently encourage them to only buy fair trade uh, labeled uh, products. Uh, and you know, it will be such a delight to actually know that we have a market that believes in us and that is ready to pay uh, the price for the products that we actually deliver to you. So for you first is really to appreciate, we hope, I hope we had more uh, forums such as this, if nothing else, just to bring our context to you, enlighten you on how we feel and how we, where we sit and just say, what, how can we partner uh, together? Because we realize that we cannot do it by yourself. And we also under, see the passion you have to ensure that the climate uh, matters are delivered well and that the fair trade movement becomes at the forefront, either the forefront of delivering that. Thank you, Mary. Thank you for all of those answers. I definitely feel more enlightened now. Um, and thank you, everyone else, um, for your questions as well. Um, I'll now hand over to Martin for kind of closing remarks. So thanks again, Mary. Thank you, Kira, um, for the question and answer session. And thank you to Charles for the introduction. Um, thank you to Catherine for organising and putting together um, this event this evening. But most of all, um, thank you, Mary, for joining us. It was a pleasure for me to meet you when you were in Glasgow for COP26 last year. And I'm delighted that you took up the invitation to give this evening's lecture. Um, you talked about um, people being champions for fair trade. Um, clearly in yourself, we have tonight had a lecture from a real champion for fair trade. And that important um, message you had about ensuring that the producer voice is at the center of the debate around trade justice and around climate justice. And I think um, one of the key um, points that you made for me was that this is about a human rights issue and seeing it in that context um, and campaigning on the basis of campaigning for human rights, for trade justice and for climate justice um, and standing with fair trade farmers and workers and producers across the globe. Um, and I think in terms of the message clearly from yourself this evening is that we need to keep going in terms of on that, in terms of supporting fair trade, in terms of lobbying businesses to do more, and in terms of lobbying governments to do more um, here in Scotland and the UK and around the world. And I think in terms of your lecture this evening, um, you made the reference to staying the course um, I think it is in terms of listening to people like yourself, Mary, that makes us committed to stay the course for fair trade. So thank you very much, Mary. Thank you to all of you for joining us. I hope you found it um, enjoyable, enlightening and inspiring. And um, hopefully in terms of you'll continue um, to follow us in terms of on social media um, and you'll be able to um, find out about future events and join us for that too. So thank you all. Thank you, Mary. And good night. Good night and thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine, for having me.